Hello, and a warm welcome to this very special 5 by 15 event with two extraordinary writers and thinkers, Amir Srinivasan and Lisa Tadeo. And we're thrilled to be welcoming so many people to watch this webinar both live and on the catch up. And please don't forget to put your questions for Lisa and Amir in the Q&A box, which you'll find at the bottom right hand corner of your screens. So let me do a quick introduction before we get started. Amir Srinivasan is a philosopher and the best-selling author of The Right to Sex, one of the most talked about books in recent times, and it's just been published in um, paperback this May. The Right to Sex is a landmark collection of essays that examines the politics and ethics of sex in the 21st century, from pornography to incels, rape culture to sex work. And it's been acclaimed by critics um, and authors ranging from Judith Butler to Pandora Sykes. Amir is currently the professor, the Chichley Professor of Social and Political Theory at All Souls College, Oxford, and has held permanent um, or visiting academic posts at UCL, Yale, NYU, and UCLA. And in conversation this evening, we have the wonderful Lisa Tadeo, no stranger to Five by 15. Lisa is, of course, the New York Times bestselling author of Three Women, which was hailed instantly as a classic, a staggering work of nonfiction that's the result of hours spent in the company of its subjects. It's become a worldwide sensation, forever changing what we think about women and desire, and it's a soon to be a Showtime TV series coming this autumn. She, um, her debut novel is Animal, which was published in 2021, and Ghost Lover is a new collection of short stories forthcoming in June. So we're thrilled to have them both with us. Please don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A box, as I've said, um, and we will come to as many as we can towards the end. But for now, I will hand over to Lisa and say a warm welcome to you both. Thank you so much, Daisy. And um, I just want to echo my, I, well, I've said it a little bit earlier, but I mean, I just want to say it to you again in front of some more people. Um, when I first read your book, I was just floored. Um, I thought that it was just such a perfect, you, the way that you interpolated science and history and facts with actual feeling and rawness and emotion in such a honest um, and powerful way was just like, I hadn't seen anything like that. And so many of the things struck so many nerves and chords and made me think. And what it did was also made me go and read the other people that you mentioned. It just, it was like such an expansive view. And I could talk to you for hours um, and ask you a million questions. So I'm just, I'm just gonna get to as many as I can. Um, and then I will turn to audience questions. So if you guys start thinking about stuff, I'm gonna ask the things that are burning in my mind, but I want the ones that are burning in yours too to get to a Mia. So please put them in the chat and I will get to as many of those as I can as well. Um, and welcome, Amia, you are brilliant. Um. <laughs> well, Lisa, can I just say um, what a huge honor and thrill it is to be in conversation with you. I sort of can't believe it's taken this long for us to so meet weird. I know. given um, our convergent preoccupations yes. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm so glad it's finally it's finally happening so thank you thank you so much for having this conversation with me and and fire away I can't wait to <laughs> what it is you'd like to know okay I will um I wanted to start with um with how you came to write the book because I, I think you the right to sex and you were inspired to write that after um about Elliot Rogers, the Virginia Tech shooter. Um, and you said, and I'm just gonna read it because it's so true and honest and, and also just exactly what I felt too. I was struck as were others who read it by its peculiar, the, I'm sorry, the Elliot Rogers' manifesto that appeared on the internet. I was struck as were others who read it by its peculiar blend of narcissistic rage, misogynistic and class-driven entitlement and racialized self-loathing. And I was struck by the very same thing. So I guess, I guess what, what were you hoping to get to the bottom of, which I think you get to the bottom of in a thousand different ways, but I would just like to hear it from your mouth. <laughs> so I felt that although everyone was talking about the Roger phenomenon, no one was saying and everyone was saying lots of important things. And by everyone, I mean feminists. I mean, there were lots of uh, other commentators who were saying absurd things about the Elliot Roger massacre, saying things like, well, he also killed men, so it couldn't be driven by 
hatred um, for, against women. And feminists were responding properly by explaining sort of misogyny 101, male sexual entitlement 101, and most importantly, drawing a very strong connection between his rather extreme behavior and the more daily insidious forms of entitlement and harassment to which some women are subject um, ubiquitously. But no one was saying, no one wanted to touch this, this, this red hot thing at the middle of this phenomenon, which was Roger's own claim to having been sexually marginalized on mm -hmm. the basis of one, his race, right? He's mixed race, he was mixed race. And two, his failure to live up to the ideals of hetero masculinity, right? He was shy, he was bad at sports, he, he was effeminate. And he counted these things among the reasons for his sexual and romantic rejection. Now, it's not that I think the account was right, right? At the very least, as I say in the essay, um, it was overdetermined that he wasn't going to be attractive to women because he was also rageful and narcissistic and, and treated women terribly um, and was a raging racist. But in principle, right, the kind of complaint he was making uh, could be a genuine, legitimate, justified complaint. Because in fact, we know that lots of people are sexually and romantically marginalized on the basis of their race or their class or um, the, you know, the particular kind of body they might have, um, and also for not meeting the, the demands of heteromasculinity. And I really wanted to, to take on this red hot, untouchable issue and then show what it looked like to really hold it in mm -hmm. one's hands. Because to me, feminism is at its best when it's embracing those complexities and contradictions yeah. of desire and politics. Yeah, and I think that's, it's funny because I, what, what, one of the things I, I love about your book, um, of all the essays in it, is that the complexity of each, it, it's not cut and dry, right? Like things are, and you know, you bring in all these, all the issues of, of what, um, what a, you know, carceral feminism will do because of, of, of different races and who it, who it thwarts and who it lifts up. And I think that the complexities are so rarely addressed. We just put that Elliot Rogers into this like bad category. We don't talk about the larger issues that, and, but your book does. And, and that's exactly, I just found it so illuminating and all, and answered all the things that I kind of wanted to, you know, explore more of. And there was, I'm, I'm forgetting that the, I don't know if you named him, but there was also a man that you spoke to who said he identified with a lot of Elliot Rogers's issues, right? But condemned the whole thing. So I feel like that person was not quite an incel in, in the actual, you know, just kind of identified and understood it. But I'm, and, and, and it offered so much elucidation, but I'm wondering, did you speak, how many, like, I'm so curious about the incel phenomenon. How many, not how many specifically did you speak to, but like how, what kind of process did you take in learning more about that culture? Yeah, well, I spent a lot of time, as I, I know you have, on the kind of in the sort of darker parts of the Internet, um, <laughs> reading, you know, on Reddit and 4chan and these other um, uh, sites where aggrieved, entitled men gather. And what's so and, and what's so interesting, of course, is the way in which some of these conversations then act as a gateway to um, other forms of radicalization, uh, race radicalization, political radicalization in general. Um, and I think there's something really worth understanding here. There's something, I mean, if you are interested in the darkness of the human mind and psyche, there's a lot here, but also if you're really interested in understanding, I think, a contemporary political reality, because I think the the, the same sort of aggrieved entitlement that you see running through the incel movement is 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 very similar to um, what you find uh, motivate motivating the storming of the Capitol, right? Um, and Trump's voter base. Um, there's this there's this sense of an entitled an entitlement to a certain kind of social status on the basis of one's gender and race. Um, 
and and a sense that that entitlement isn't being met because of a conspiracy of people who should be lower on the status hierarchy, women, immigrants, people of color, doing better than you and gaining control. And so what's complicated here is on one hand, there's something very ugly, right? There's overt racism, there is um, intense misogyny, um, at, on, but at the same time, there's also just the very tiniest, cr- tiny kernel of a critique of hierarchy, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think for feminists, the question is, how do you reach inside these, these kind of quite ugly movements and find that, that, that kernel of something egalitarian and non-hierarchical and, and expand it and give it life, right? Mm-hmm. As a way of, um, as a way of, of dealing head on with the kind of extremism that one that one finds in contemporary politics. Because what's so interesting to me is like you're saying, they are railing against this sort of system, right? But at the same time, there's a self loathing, right? That they are very self aware of not I me, mean, not all of them. But from what I've seen, there's, there's a sort of like, yes, I'm a despicable human, not because of my race or you know or whatever and I'm not lifted up because of it's more like I'm not lifted up because of let's say it's a white incel I'm not lifted up because of my whiteness and that's not fair right but they have a hatred for everything else about them and so I think it's almost like the only thing that is good about them is whiteness yeah is how I've always felt it kind of um mutates and uh, yeah i mean i'm just i've been fascinated and and reading your book was a it was just like it was the perfect and also i didn't know the origin of the word was um was a queer woman i i thought that was so interesting and you so beautifully compared this queer woman trying to have a community for herself in in a very gentle way and um and she basically you know, she, she then looked at it later and was like, I've, you know, mm-hmm. involuntarily <laughs> created this. Um, and I just thought that was so, so great. Um, just yeah, she so- just released this thing in, into the world. And what's so interesting about the origin point in this very early, you know, Internet 1.0 um, um, support group uh, is that that support group is not just run by a woman. There were lots of women in it, right? Yeah. There were women, men, uh, people of uh, diverse sexualities and genders um, who came together because they saw themselves as involuntarily celibate, but they yeah. meant they, they not just celibate, lacking relationships, things that they, right. that they wanted to have. Um, and of course, fast forward to now where self-identified incels deny the existence of such women, right? They insist that women are all capable of having satisfying romantic and sexual relationships because they hold all of the cards. This, of course, flies in the face of the statistical evidence. More women are involuntary celibates than men. Of course, what these men are always implicitly thinking when they're talking about women, is they're talking about a tiny, narrow group of women. They're interested in young, white, able-bodied, and conventionally beautiful women. They are not thinking about divorced women over 60. They're not thinking about women of color, immigrant women. They're not thinking about disabled women. And that's the kind of, the the contradiction within the incel movement, oh, sorry, I hate calling it a movement, subcultural phenomenon. <laughs> On one hand, there's a kind of railing against a hierarchy, which genuinely is objectionable. Yeah, yeah. Right. But then there's a reinforcement of that hierarchy. They always want to reinforce the hierarchy of, of, of female attractiveness, for example. Um, and so for them, the women who would be involuntarily celibate just don't even count yeah. within the category of women. Yeah. Um, I, uh, one of the other things that I'm, I'm so interested in, and I was so interested in reading um, in, in, in The Right to Sex was, um, well, first of all, actually, have you ever read the essay that Mary Gateskill wrote for Harper's several years back where she talks about having been raped a number of times? I think it was three times. I, I don't want to overstate it, but she talks about um, one was a stranger rape, like someone just off the street, like, you know, and one of the other ones she discusses was a man that she uh, invited into her home who was actually uh i think i think younger than her and a student 
mm -hmm. um, of hers, I believe. And she sort of went through with the, um, I don't know if she went through, I don't know if she had intercourse. I, I can't remember, something happened that made her feel, um, that made her feel like she had been assaulted. Mm -hmm. And then, and she said that that was the rape that hurt the most. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so interesting and I've always thought about it. And I, and the reason she, it hurt her the most, I, I've spoken with her about it, was the, her sort of her own perceived complicity. Um, which I think is is so um, it's just so interesting that we have this this complicity and it's I, I, I don't know I guess my question is it feels like there are that that we have that, that we are trying to read our own experiences onto others so often when it comes to rape so my question to you is is there a spectrum of severity for, for rape and is it like something measurable or should it be utterly subjective? And obviously the legalities of that goes, you know, has to kind of, it's like a balancing act, but I'm just curious about your feelings because I think about it all the time. Yeah, I actually haven't read that Mary Gets Glossy, but that's exactly what I'm gonna do as soon as we get off this call. <laughs> uh, amazing. Yeah, what a, what a great question. So I think, <clears throat> I think the question can be answered in, kind of two ways. So when we're thinking about the severity in terms of what's what the victim of rape subjectively experiences, I think it's actually, as the Gates Gillespie clearly demonstrates, very hard to predict that from the outside. Yeah. Um, and I think this is what a lot of um, those men who haven't been victims of rape like tend not to understand, which is that... Um, <laughs> how small things can actually feel like outsized violations, whereas yeah. maybe being, you know, subject to just, you know, classic um, coercive, violent stranger rape um, can in some sense feel less, uh, less insidious, like it gets into your head less in, in precisely because it might conform to the stereotype of, of real rape. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not trying to in any way downplay the horror no, no. of that, but I think that um, precisely because we have this conventional understanding of what blameless rape looks like, blameless yeah. on the part of the victim, when things fall away from that paradigm, then they can be more, way more psychically damaging and horrifying than, it, than one can really understand from the outside. Then there's a separate question about how should the law think yeah. about the severity of rape um, and I think these questions should always be kind of held, <laughs> held, up, held apart because I think too much of our thinking about rape comes from the law. Yeah. I mean, our, our obsession with consent, for example, and, and consent as the, the criterion of morally permissible sex comes from a legal paradigm in which you need a very clear cut dividing line between legally permissible and yeah. impermissible sex. And that the law just needs that because it has to make decisions. But of course, I don't need to tell you this. I mean, sex is just so much more complex than, <laughs> than that, right? Than consensual and non-consensual. It's even more complex than just consent or non-consent in the presence of power. It's like, okay, what kind of power differential? And like, how is it playing out? And how is it being used in this particular moment, right? They're just endless questions. And in fact, to really understand um, what's going on in any particular incidents, what we need is the kind of rich, subjectively rich narrative that you uh, have, have given us. And it just kind of shows um, how reductive these kind of legal concepts are. So, so I think in the in the law, you know, it's you probably just need to have um, w without thinking, without kind of reaffirming that certain forms of rape are like real rape and others are just uh, less are less serious. You know, um, the the thing you're actually probably really thinking about is something like reasonable, like blameworthiness, right? And then we get into questions of um, what does the reasonable well, this traditional standard in the law is what would a reasonable man think, right? Yeah. Would a reasonable man know that this was not, not consensual? Yeah. But as Catherine McKinnon has argued, like, why should a reasonable man be the standard? Why isn't the question <laughs> what a reasonable woman think? Uh, yeah. 
consensual. Um, so, I, you know, I understand the impulse to think that certain forms of rape are, I mean, you know, like what happened, for example, to Jyoti Singh on that bus in Bombay where she's gang raped and, and, then, and then murdered. Uh, I mean, that is a particularly horrific crime. And I think there's nothing to be gained in saying that's just the same thing as other forms of sexual assault. At the same time, as soon as we start admitting those things, we are we're, 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 we have we run the risk of reinforcing this idea that only really like brutal rapes um, are, are genuine violations and that's not true. Yeah, that I mean, it's it, that is exactly it's like it's a very slippery slope because you hear that story and you know on the polar, not polar opposite, but you know that uh, you know, as far as in your book is concerned, the um, the young woman at UMass who had that um, relationship with really who had that evening with um, with a, a student and the way that she spoke about, um, well, actually, can you tell us all a bit about that so I don't butcher it? Cause I just- <laughs> So I should just say that my account of this, uh, what happened uh, that evening entirely comes from the, um, the legal proceedings, right? So there's a kind of limited uh, knowledge here. Um, but, you know, basically you have these two undergrad college kids drinking, getting high, um, consensually hooking up. And then at a certain point, she feels like she doesn't really want to continue. Um, and I think she says something like, I don't want to have sex. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. And then, but they keep on kind of kissing and she feels like she wants to leave. And he never tries to, he never makes her stay. He certainly never threatens her or coerces her, but she feels this kind of internalized pressure to stay and specifically to keep on giving him a hand job. And then when it finishes and they like exchange numbers, she, she, she comes to feel like she's been assaulted, mm -hmm. right? So she comes to feel like something wrong happened. And she has this fascinating phrase where she says, you know, it's just the duty of UMass women to like keep on going. And she concludes therefore that she's been assaulted. Um, and it doesn't actually, what, what happens doesn't meet the legal definition for rape, but nonetheless, there's this huge um, academic, like in, university led investigation. He ends up um, losing various kinds of entitlements, having a nervous breakdown. He's black, by the way, uh, he's a child of immigrants, um, gets very sick, ultimately uh, uh, transfers, um, uh, ultimately leaves the university, sues and, and, and gets and wins right, because they have yeah. violated his due process rights. Um, and what I think this case sort of shows is when you read it, and I'm not doing it, you know, it's, you have to go read it for, your, for yourself, and I describe it at length in the book. One, oh, the thing I want to say is like, yeah, this isn't, this isn't a case of rape. It's not even a case of assault, but what's going on, but there is nonetheless something wrong here. Yeah. And the wrongness lies in the fact that she has, like so many women, especially young women, internalized a set of normative expectations according to which women who arouse men need to finish the job. And it's not like he was even asserting that that was true, right? But it was so internalized. So in a way, what she was assaulted by, by was patriarchy, yeah. not by this particular man. And so then the question is like, what, what process would have been better? Like it ruined this young black man's life. We know that black men are disproportionately accused, especially on university campuses of sexual assault. And she herself didn't even really want him to be punished. She said that she wanted him to be punished as lightly as possible, given all of the gray in the case. I think what she really wanted was to have a conversation with him. A, a mediated conversation in which she says, do you know like what that was like for me? Yeah. You know the difference in the set of expectations you bring to an episode like that versus what I or other women bring. And I think she wanted him to understand that. Yeah. Um, and so one question I think we should be asking on university campuses, right, that's my dog, is, you know, whether we can put in process, uh, in, put in place different kinds of processes for addressing at least some of these cases of, um, of, of sexual assault allegations. And I think that 
that's one of the things that I learned the most from your book is that we really our I mean our I'm, I'm using the collective our I, I you know I think I'm, I'm speaking for the U.S. from my own experiences and you know that of seeing my my child you know there is no real sex education um, and that's why you know when you talk about porn being like this is the closest that kids get to having a sort of real education that doesn't feel, um, you know, that's kind of, that's just, it, it, so because they don't have that, um, and I think there's a big difference between like the, you know, the men who um, are saying that the rules flip, the men in their sort of like 50s and up who are saying that the rules flipped at some point and it's not their fault that they don't know the new rules. I think it's different for, for young women and young men who are growing up in in a society that that where porn is such a giant part of how they look at how to have sex. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you, and I want to read a, a quote that really stuck with me from well, I highlighted so many things, but um, the law must address each individual on a case by case basis and must start from the assumption that Harvey Weinstein is no more likely to be an abuser than a 90 year old grandmother. Um, but the norms of the law do not set the norms of rational belief. Rational belief is proportionate to evidence, the strong statistical evidence that men like Weinstein tend to abuse their power. And I just found that so, so, um, just so, so like illuminating that, you know, that's where we kind of have to go from, but we also kind of, kind of can't in a sense, because we can't sociologically do that in a sense because our brains are not like we're like what why would the 90 year old grandmother you know why would she want to do that but maybe she does um and one of the things that really struck me uh was um oh the other the other quote was defender of men's rights like to say that believe women violates the presumption of innocence but this is a category error the presumption of innocence is a legal principle it answers to our sense that it is worse all else being equal for the law to wrongly punish than to wrongly exonerate um, which is why the burden of proof rests with the accuser and not the accused. And one of the things I wanted to ask you your thoughts on, because I remember hearing it and, and having mixed emotions about it, um, regarding the Al Franken allegations from several years ago, Bill Maher said, women should be heard and should always, we should always keep in mind that the vast majority of women are reporting serious abuse or truthful, but women also didn't completely lose the ability to lie in 2017. And my question to you is how do we reconcile these ideas in the discourse about rape and assault and cancel culture because i wrestle with a lot of that in my own mind and and beyond yeah okay so so many uh, sorry so, so many different thoughts so just, I just it, quoted you at you <laughs> so try, try and get me back um if you feel like i'm if i'm going off yes no please i want to hear it all because i want to say various various things so <clears throat> Look, in a kind of ideal situation, I don't mean so ideal where there's no assault, but a, a, a situation in which people, regardless of their identity, are, um, are treated with the same amount of credence, right? Yeah. Uh, then we wouldn't need the slogan, believe women, right? I think believe women shouldn't be understood as a kind of, um, an exhortation that women never lie. Obviously women lie. Um, and also, by the way, women will lie about rape, right? That happens. Believe women should be understood as a kind of corrective slogan that's supposed to correct for a systematic um, asymmetry in the economy of belief, whereby women, even who are making credible threats, I'm oh, sorry, credible um, accusations of harassment or assault, especially against powerful men, aren't believed and aren't believed at many levels, like aren't kind of just generally believed, but also um, can be systematically disbelieved by the criminal justice system. So I think that's the, the right way to, to, to understand the slogan, believe women. I think it's also the right way to use it. Mm -hmm. I think it's wrong to use it um, as uh, uh, in as an insistence that women always tell the truth and men are always lying 
right, right? In, the, in these right. kind of he said, she said cases. Um, in, part, in part because of the long history under conditions of white domination, like in uh, the US of black men and men of color more generally being falsely accused of rape especially by white women and by white men manipulating white women. So against that long history of the false rape accusation being used as a tactic of racial and often class-based violence, um, you can't just proceed by just believing all women, right? Um, so, so I think one has to in a way just be alert to all of this complexity right? One needs to remember that on one hand, women are systematically disbelieved. One has to also remember that um, the false rape allegation sometimes is really wielded as this kind of quite powerful political uh, weapon, especially against marginalized men. Um, one also needs to be thinking about the evidence and what the evidence actually suggests and supports. Um, and then there was this final thing that you just tacked on about cancellation, Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I, I take it that what you're getting getting at there is, well, what do we do once we have a genuinely really credible accusation? And in many cases, we have many allegations, right? Many uh, credible, coherent, and consistent allegations. What do we what do we do um, with these men? And here and this is not a very emotionally satisfying thing to say. I think we need to have difficult conversations about rep reparative and transformative justice, yeah. right? Yeah. I don't think we can, I think it's, people have, it's a bad politics that thinks that it can just give up on people and write people off entirely. Um, and it's also just um, feeds into a broader kind of punitive politics that doesn't actually serve women. Right. Yeah. I mean, think about how rates of sexual assault against women, domestic violence, none of these things have gone down in all of these decades of intense uh, policing and criminalization in the US, especially. Um, so that kind of punitive carceral response is not one that serves women uh, either. Um, that all said, a lot of these high profile men, at least, who've been brought temporarily brought down by Me Too don't seem that interested in changing, right? Aren't, you know, they say sorry, but then I say in the book that they're like a bit like a kid growing weary of time out, like two minutes in, like, yeah. can I come back in and play without being interested in changing, reckoning with what they might have done. But I think space needs to be held open for those kinds of difficult conversations that allow people to change and become better people. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it's funny what you say about the high profile men not really being interested in change is that, you know, I read, um, I read the, the two, uh, the two stories that two of the stories that you mentioned when they came out, the one in um, the editor of, oh gosh, can you help me out with the names? There's Jean Gomeshi. And then am I saying his name correctly? Yeah. Okay. And Ian Bruma, is and that what Ian Bruma, exactly. Um, I I read those when they came when they were out, and I was like fascinated by. They were very different, but also had the same general whiff, <laughs> the same sort of thing. And it's and it's an interesting thing. And and Louis C.K. Um, the same kind of thing. It's like what you what you wrote in in your book. I really and I also I, I I'm kind of conscious of like giving stuff away because I think I don't want to like, you know, not say correctly or adequately what you say so, so brilliantly in, in your book. So I want everyone needs to buy it um, so that I, they won't just have my butcherings on record. But um, Louis C.K. is essentially went to a, a comedy club and, and you know, just made more, it, it, it wasn't, I was really hoping as someone who had been a fan of his prior to, you know, I mean, I was I, I think his his show that um, his show is one of the best comedy shows I've, I've I really had a you know I, I thought he was great um, I thought that when he quote unquote came back that it was going to be like because of what I've always thought was a high sort of IQ that he had beyond his talents as a comic I thought he was going to come forth 
and back in a way that was really like intensely healing for mm -hmm. people. I really did. I had that really like wild hope and it hasn't happened. And, um, and I think Aziz Ansari had did that in a much, I mean, he also had, you know, a, a more sort of defensible situation. Again, there's these degrees, you know, like what, how bad is Aziz versus Louis CK? And then you have to call into question the idea of, of color and, and race and all that with those two as well. And it's like, there's just so much to kind of take on and take in. Um, and well, one of my other favorite quotes in the book is I wanted to tell him, this was after, in response to um, the, the awful thing that happened to Jyoti Singh, uh, a friend's father brought it up with you at dinner, but Indians are such civilized people, he said. I wanted to tell him that there is no civilization under patriarchy. And that is so beautiful and so like, ugh, <laughs> heart wrenching. Um, and one of the things that I think about a lot too is beyond the patriarchy is I always think about the patriarchy that is also perpetrated by women against each other. Um, that's one of my biggest, like, I'm like, I'm, I'm in awe of the women who voted for Trump and the, you know, I mean, I, it's just like, I can continuously in awe. Um, and I guess I just wanted to talk to you about how do you feel about patriarchy perpetrated by women against women? Mm. Yeah. I, let, wait, sorry. I'm just going to say one thing really quickly yeah. before I get into that fantastic question, which is when you were asking me about the editor, I thought you were asking about which editor had commissioned Jean Gameshi, which is Ian Baruma, but Ian Baruma's, um, right. Uh, he got never been accused of it. Yeah. Um, I just wait, let me just say one more thing about Louis C.K. and what I think a lot yeah. of men are missing is that people love a sincere and meaningful apology. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, not everyone, but for a lot of people, um, it's kind of heart melting right to hear yeah. someone read and a, a good apology is one that begins with the recognition of harm done and responsibility taken yeah. for that harm and it's an incredibly powerful gesture if it's done right um and so it's fascinating to me all of these men who simply declare themselves cancelled declare their lives over then in as in louis ck's case go and perform a sellout show um and get a standing ovation like a year later um, and but then have but then don't engage in the exercise of apologizing right um so sorry oh my gosh i'm forgetting the question the this the second question you just asked um patriarchy perpetrated ah, by yes, women, women. <laughs> yeah i mean look i don't think of patriarchy as um i mean patriarchy is a bit like capitalism right it has this life of its own and of course it is it's a form of it's a system it's a political social psychic economic system that works its way through men but also oppresses men and also works its way through women right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um in the set in the same sense I, I don't know how useful this is for the non-Marxists out there, but, but you know, I, <laughs> uh, like I think on, on a proper understanding of, of capitalism, yes, you have the agents of, of, of capitalism, you have capitalists, but in a sense, the system is using them as well. It's kind of working through them. And, and there's a sense in which they're also oppressed by their system, although their lives are qualitatively a lot better than the lives of their workers. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a kind of similar thing going on. I think feminism needs to probably work harder at articulating this um, to men and with men. I think feminism needs to really explain, although it's been explaining this for decades now, for, <laughs> but that it, it's not about um, thinking that all men are scum and that all women are great. It's also not simply about, although it's partly about stripping men of certain forms of unearned privilege, right? Mm -hmm. It's also about compensating them with certain and new and undreamt forms of liberation. Because I think just about every man I know in one way or another has been harmed, repressed, shamed, constrained by patriarchal expectations of masculinity, mm -hmm. right? 
Mm-hmm. That goes for the super straight acting men, my, you know, my gay friend, men, you know, it, um, and, and of course, talking about the complicity of women in this system is absolutely, is absolutely right. You couldn't possibly explain, I think, the success, the continued domination of men as a class in general, uh, without explaining women's internalization of that domination, in part because and this is a point that Simone de Beauvoir made in The Second Sex. Mm-hmm. In some ways, it's sort of easier to see yourself as a mere object, right? Not taking yourself totally seriously as an equal subject and locus of agency and freedom. There's something easier about simply um, going along with male power, mm-hmm. even though it, of course, always brings its costs, right? Yeah. Um, but it's also it's very hard, I think, to um, to step up, step up against it. Yeah, that's brilliant, and and exactly exactly it. And I I I'm like I have about fifty more questions, but I just um, am looking at a, a number of audience questions that I really want to make sure that we get to. So I'm going to ask these, and if we have more time for me, I'm going to come back to me. Right. <laughs> Um, I, an anonymous attendee asked, which I find it, I, um, to speak more, I'm sorry, I just lost the, can you please say more about Jean Gomeshi's case? I have not been able to make up my mind about how to assess what happened to him. Mm. I would love to hear that too, because I mean, I, I, I've made up more of my mind, but I would like to know what, what your mind says. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's been such a long time since I've read about the case and I, and I sort of don't have the ins and outs at my fingertips anymore. I mean, the thing I was really struck by um, was the piece he wrote in the NYRB um, mm-hmm. in which um, there was there was no there was no remorse there was no taking of responsibility he really saw himself as the victim of this of this witch hunt um and that in a way for me is the disappointing thing like it doesn't surprise me when powerful especially intensely charismatic men and popular men as as Gameshi was um you know abuse and use their power in all sorts of ways in ways that sometimes i think they aren't totally aware of right i think I think they all get some inkling of it, right? You don't go through life um, harassing women and never having any signs of that harassment. Women flinch, they walk away, they Mm. quit, they do all of these things that um, you have to be sort of actively willful and ignoring, which I think is a really important part of the dynamic of a lot of this harassment. Um, And so I think in a way what disturbed me much more was was the sense of aggrieved entitlement with which Gomeshi wrote um, r- wrote that that piece? But I do discuss this a bit more in the book. So um. by the book, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another attendee has asked in your book, and this is actually a question that I had as well. So it's perfect. You tantalizingly float the idea of a kind of positive creative sex education. Mm-hmm. Can you say a bit more about what that might look like? And the next part of the question is why it's needed, but I feel like mm. it's definitely needed. <laughs> but. Yeah, I mean, as you know, the thing I, the thing I say about, um, I mean, I mean, sex education is in such a enfeebled state in a place like the U.S., the U.K., and so many places in the world that it's. Um, just the spreading of the sharing of some accurate information about um, the mechanics of sex and STDs and pregnancy and contraception would be a huge advance, right? But what we ideally want, I think, is all of that, plus giving young people the sense that um, sex is sort of what they want it to be. I think young people are are on the whole desperate for scripts Mm -hmm. um, to do all sorts of things but sex perhaps most of all which is why so many young people watch porn not for stimulation or pleasure but for learning to understand how to do things Um, and so 
what would it be to not just sup- answer that desire from young people, but in a way to refuse to give that answer and to say, yeah, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you lots of facts about, about biology, about non-normative sexualities, about how different people do different things. But then what I'm ultimately interested in is throwing you back on yourself as an autonomous sexual agent, such that you come to see this question about like what sex is, it is in part a matter of like what you choose it to be and collectively choose it to be. Um, so that's that's sort of what my ideal sex education uh, would in, would involve. Um, but it's it's you know it's it's and it is something we should we should demand. It should be a demand that's on par with something like universal healthcare. Yeah. But like universal healthcare in the U.S. Re- remains a kind of horizon of utopian possibility. <laughs> yes, many things. Um... I wanted. I'm going to skip back to one of the things I wanted to to talk to you about really quick because, um, as you as you know, probably in my book, uh, with three women, um, there's a young woman named Maggie who had this relationship with her teacher, um, and your book was so amazing to read, sort of like to just get to, to hear the philosophy behind that which I had. Um, already sort of come to by hearing her story, which is why when you talk about the personal and the political being so interwoven when it comes to sex is like so it just it was just so um, mind opening. But um, but you you quote Freud who said, however highly he may pro it is the teacher who absorbs the student's erotic energies into himself. However highly he may prize love, the good teacher must prize even more highly the opportunity to help his student. Um, and I found that so beautiful because one of the things that, you know, that I thought when I read about Maggie's story and for those unacquainted, it was a young woman. She is, she is a young woman in Fargo, North Dakota, who, um, had a relationship with her teacher, alleged. That's something that I've been trained to say. Um, and uh, and he was named teacher of the year. She brought the charges against him and people essentially, they either didn't believe her or believed that he hadn't done anything. And um, and my, my sort of battle cry with it was he was supposed to be her teacher. And that is the number one, like he, when you have and that whole, your whole, you know, as a professor yourself, your understanding of it um, is so, I, I could just talk to you for hours about it, but instead I just want to really direct everyone here listening and beyond to that that section what, what what i'm sorry tell me what the essay is called it's called on not sleeping with your students great exactly perfect perfect title to an essay um i want to specifically direct anyone with children or um or anyone who's sort of who has confusion about about student teacher relationships because as you mentioned in the book there are ones that are perfectly permissible and and one of the things that i was always really clued into when it came to Maggie in my book was the idea that she also had 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 an experience. She fell in love. She was groomed. There were, she was a victim, but she also fell in love. And those two things can coexist um, and must coexist if we were to respect the woman telling us her story. But the, the bigger issue is he should not have done that as her teacher. Forget he's married, forget she's underage, forget all of the stuff that is legally wrong um as a teacher that's something in your book that i just was like oh my god hearing those things was like so um uh just so inspiring and actually i one of the things i've i i meant to do was send your book to maggie herself because i know that it will just like i i can't believe i haven't done it yet and i'm just remembering that um but anyway i I that would be amazing. I would love for I would love for her to read that. I mean, because of course, reading that part of the you know that thread of of the book, it's just like just about everything I want to say in that essay is kind of encapsulated by by that by Maggie's story. Um, I think this is sort of coming back again to this earlier theme of how we often use these legal paradigms to try and explain and account for. Um, extra legal reality. So when people talk about uh, teacher-student sex, especially when it doesn't involve underage students in the university context, 
people often want to say it's problematic because it can't really involve consent, right? Because the, the power asymmetry is such that it doesn't really involve right. consent. Well, anyone who's been in the university, and if you've been in the university, you know people who've been in these relationships, um, you, you know that they do very often involve consent. They're obviously co super coercive, abusive professors, but they're also the professors and students who, you know, fall in love with each other and have consensual relationships. And But the problem I wanted to get at was precisely the problem you say, well, is teaching someone really compatible with redeploying that intense energy that emerges in the classroom for your own kind of narcissistic sexual and romantic gratification as a teacher i don't think it is yeah. and freud the quotation that you read out freud in the original version is talking about the duty that the therapist owes the patient right because freud saw this a very long time ago he says look the patient uh, therapist sorry the therapist uh, patient relationship is such that intense emotions will often arise. And yeah. in fact, the patient will often feel themselves to be in love. And it's the job of the therapist for the good of the patient to take that energy and use it for the therapeutic outcome. And I think the same thing is simply true in the case of, of teaching. Um, that is the duty of the teacher insofar as they're gonna be a good teacher. Um, it's not about consent. It's not even really about power. It's about the specifics of what teachers owe their students. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's what they owe. They owe. They owe just teaching. And you know, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, another attendee has asked, "What does it mean to think about our desires as political and social, not individual?" Can you explain what you mean by this? So I want to say that they are both highly individual and social or political, right? So again, it's that kind of contradictory, ambivalent understanding of a phenomenon. So of course, our sexual desires um, and preferences are highly personal things. Mm -hmm. They um, are private things unless we choose to make them public, but they also tend to be, can be very specific to us, our individual stories, our individual histories, our individual formations. Um, and I don't want to take away from any of that. But I just want to note that it's also true that broader social and political structures and often oppressive social and political structures shape our desires and our understandings in particular of what is desirable, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. the case of racism is, is the clearest, right? Mm -hmm we under racist uh, societies, we are taught from a very early age to think of people of certain races as um, sexually desirable and people of other races as not. And of course it um, interacts in complex ways with gender, right? So you can take the hypersexualized black man, right? And then contrast that with black women who under conditions of white supremacy are thought of as, um, sexually undesirable, but thus particularly rapeable, right? So the sexual, uh, the, the stereotypical oh, sexual so undesirability of black women makes them disproportionately susceptible to actual sexual yeah. assault. And what you'll often find, I mean, a great place to observe this is, you know, start looking on some dating websites, uh, some dating apps, and you'll often find, I, I mean, I recently just saw a conversation like this posted where, to, it was on Grinder, I think, and two men uh, talking back and forth. And one guy, this white guy is like, uh, are you Mediterranean? Like, you're really sexy. And he's like, no, I'm actually Indian. And then the guy responds, I don't do Indians. And what's so interesting about this is that he was attracted to him yeah. before he knew he was Indian. Like, um, so it's, and, and then you had lots of people commenting on this post saying, well, it's just a personal preference. And you're like, well, it's not just a person, <laughs> right? I can tell you a whole social and political story about where this supposedly highly individual and personal preference is coming from. There's a separate question about what you do about it, right? And um, that's more complicated. 
<laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Um, so I'm going to um, ask this one. I think the conversation around the influence of porn is fascinating, especially as companies have begun labeling their content as feminist. I'm curious for your thoughts on ways in which the focus on sex positivity also carries with it its own pressures, i.e. to watch slash enjoy porn, to do something in sex you might not otherwise, etc. Yes. So, you know, the dream of sex positivity when it first emerged in the late 80s and early 90s was a really radical dream, right? So what it was trying to do was push against a kind of con what a kind of conservative strain within radical feminism that wanted to, you know, see women as only interested in a certain kind of very loving, often monogamous, often quite straight sex. And early sex positivists really wanted a thousand sexual flowers to bloom. And that meant the decentering and of of heteronormativity, right? It was really about the celebration of non-normative queer forms of sex. And, uh, you know, one thing that has happened is that that part, that, that kind of radical edge to sex positivity has kind of gone away in many quarters. And we're end, we end up with a kind of milk toast liberal um, uh, sex positivity, which simply says that, well, as long as you're consenting, then it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. Which is very similar to the idea that, well, as long as the Amazon worker has signed a contract, mm -hmm. it's okay that he is being like exploited in the factory, right? So a really radical sex positivity is one that um, doesn't simply say, doesn't, you know, of course affirms people's right to have consensual sex, but also tries to actively promote non-normative forms of sexual culture. Yeah. And the reason I'm saying all of this is because one non-normative form of sexual culture is not having sex. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that is a kind, and I'm not even simply talking about people who identify as asexual. I'm just talking about people who like, for whatever reason, it's not their top priority going out and having a lot of sex, or they, they're not interested in um, you know, expanding their sexual horizons, and, or they're not, they're not into watching porn. And these women, mostly, but also men, are just coded as a certain kind of sexual failure. Um, and that's particularly exacerbated, I think, under our kind of current um, economic regime where each person has to come to see themselves as a commodity, right? So you are this thing that has to be perfected um, in order to be able to make yourself viable on, on the market in general. And part of that perfection has to be like, you're having just the right amount of sex with the right kind of people exactly. and you're watching the right amount of porn and you're open to, and, and that's oppressive too. That's okay. profoundly oppressive. And I think it's really oppressive for young people. I think so many young people feel themselves to be sexual failures because they, um, they think because, because we've replaced norms of chastity with a different set of, exactly. I think, almost equally constraining norms. 100%. I feel the exact same way. Um, and, and that's just so em emblematic of everything that is in your book. Um, yeah, I am so excited that we got to have this conversation. And I want to say for everyone here who has not read the book, um, it, it really, you need to read every single page and all the footnotes in order to fully sort of absorb the complexity that, that this amazing writer and thinker and teacher has so brilliantly put in the right to sex. And you can order it from um, newandbooks.com co.uk, which is right on the screen over here. Um, Amia, it was my absolute pleasure to speak to you. And I want to speak to you again um, and again. So let's please do that. And I would love that. <laughs> have a lovely rest of your evening or afternoon. Thank you so much, Lisa. This has been fabulous. And thanks to everyone for your fantastic questions. Super great questions.
Thank you both. That was that was a brilliant, brilliant conversation. And it was a real honor for Five by 15 to have the chance to host you both. Lisa, thank you for making it such a rich and fascinating discussion and for your very, very thoughtful questions. I could have listened for much longer. The Right to Sex is out now in paperback and everyone, please pick up a copy. New and Books would be delighted to help you. And Ghost Lover by uh, Lisa is also coming in a couple of weeks. So we're really excited about that as well as the three women TV series in the autumn. But for now, it's good night from 5 by 15. Thank you all. And um, we will see you again very soon. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Thank you.